Okay, so this is the last module. Uh, so let's get started. So we'll talk about basics of read alignment and next generation sequencing analysis. So for the, for, for the course, we have mentioned a few times what is next generation sequencing. And then by, by, by looking at RNA-seq, we're actually quite well prepared for this module because we know what are the reads, what is the coverage, what is roughly speaking next generation sequencing analysis, right? Like given the DNA, you want to sequence that DNA. However, you cannot do it uh, just at once. And again, if you if you if would exist such technology where you would take the DNA and you will get a single read, a single stretch, like the entire genome, bioinformatics would be not needed. However, that's far away from being the case. So first of all, you have short fragments. You have fragments of land 100, 150, 250, and so on. But more than that, they're not just short, they there is some errors in, in the in the in the data which needs to be handled, which need to be corrected and identified. So it's a complicated problem. And then it's actually attracted quite many, research, quite many researchers across the globe to tackle this problem in a different way. So by developing the tools. And we uh, in the lab wrote recently a review about read alignment and how, how the read alignment was changing um, through the years as the technology was evolving, because that's another aspect you want to develop algorithms which are suited, you know, like which are suited the current technologies and technologies that keep changing, which is makes things quite, quite complicated on that side, on the side of development of the tool. So, and then, so what we will do, we'll talk about the very, very basic step of next generation sequencing analysis and meaning read alignment. So we would like, so remember the reference, right? We discussed a couple of times the reference. So very nicely assembled, human genome of particular individuals. Actually, probably it's few individuals already, but, but it's kind of like a few or one individual. We know very well and precisely the, the genome of that person. And especially now, because we did telomere to telomere, and it was a big consortium globally where people fill the gap. So now we have quite good version of the human genome. But again, that's like one, one, one individual. And then in general, that's a very active area of research and many papers are published in this domain. And there are open questions. For example, do you need to do population based reference, right? So now we have one reference from based on the several individuals, but we know the humans are different and especially across ancestry groups, ethnicities, whatever you call them, like people from Africa would be different from, from Europe and from Asia to the extent that certain alleles will be dominant in Africa but those alleles will be minor in Europeans population. So we know that. So that is reflected in the reference, right? Because if there's a variation in a particular base, you need to decide what to put in the reference. And that's a challenge. So, and there is an open question, would you do population-based reference, for example? Okay. So, so read alignment, right? So, so it's a very basic step for many things. And we saw that, that one way to quantify the genes is actually to align the reads onto the genome. And since we know the genes and genes are the segments, right, of, of the genome. So we will just count number of reads aligned to that particular gene. And that will be the read count, uh, the gene count. It's a little bit more complicated than that because you need to take in account that the splicing and, and we discussed that in the RNA-seq module where some reads will be corresponding to known transcripts and some will be corresponding to the novel transcript. So it's open question what you do with the transcript which are unknown when you count. So, but, but you can simplify that and just say that gene quantification is based on the read alignment where you count number of reads per gene, right? If you put that simple. And that's actually not just RNA-seq, we just started with RNA-seq, however, more typically, actually, read alignment is known for DNA-seq. So by DNA-seq, we mean several technology like whole genome sequencing, when you sequence the whole genome, or whole exome sequencing, when you just sequence the exomes. And, and there is many steps which are relying on the read alignment, like SNV, single nucleotide variants, or SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and uh, indels, insertions, deletions, and other structural variants of the human genome. 
So to detect those, you need reads to be aligned on the human genome. So something like this, right? So the bold black line is the human genome and the gray are the reads. So you need to know precisely for every read where it's coming from. Okay, so I need to admit. Okay. So where it's coming from. So that's the purpose of the read alignment, to find the location on the reference of the reads coming from, from particular individual. And, and actually that will allow you to reconstruct your personal genome in a way that given this alignment and after you call the SNPs, so what you can do, you can replace the, the, that, the SNPs in the reference genome with your own SNPs and perhaps with structural variants. So you would replace deletions, insertions, translocations, inversions, and other types of structural variants. And you will get your personal genome to set and degree, right? So as we discussed, that's like a trick we are doing in some sense that we are not able to, to assemble your personal genome just by looking at the reads. They're too short. It's actually an extremely hard problem. People have tried many, many, many years. They keep trying. And actually, they succeeded for, for simpler organisms, like for microbial organism. I think you can do, a, do assembly. However, for the human, it's hard because we have repeats, right? In the reference genome, I mean, in the genome, in the human genome, we have regions which are quite long and repetitive. They, they present across the genome. So that's that poor, like that put up extreme, that makes this problem extremely challenging from bioinformatics perspective. So people say, okay, that's, that's too complicated. Let's do, let's do read alignment. And then, so we talk about the short read, which is more classical. So now we have long reads being emerged. And the, the companies are like PugBio, Pug Pacific Biosciences, Nanopore, Oxford Nanopore in Oxford. So those companies prove, are able to generate long reads, right? We discussed that a little bit for, for, an, for an ACIC. So given the long reads, actually some of them will be longer than the gaps, when, than the, I'm sorry, longer than the repeats. So if that's the case, now people say, people claim, so if you do combination of Illumina short reads, which are accurate, and, and Park by reads and Nanapo reads, you can assemble personal genome with no reference, not using the reference. And that's actually happening. And there are several publications trying to reconstruct genome of individuals across different countries, which, like, which I expected to be different from current reference. So for example, there is one work in, uh, I think, Puerto Rico, when they try to assemble a person there, I think it's, I think the challenge there people, I mean, population there is a mix so it composed like it's of different races and ancestry. So there probably it will be quite different from the reference and, and sounds like it's working, but I think it's an open question, which technology would you combine and, and what throughput do you need to, to do that? Okay, so, okay, so let's see. So yeah, so that's kind of the same thing where we have a type of the reads, right? We have short reads, and uh, which we are talking about, right? We like for simplicity, and we have paired end, right? So we discussed a little bit yesterday paired end. So just like to 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 revise that. So when you do fragments uh, at your sequencing step, right? You don't sequence a single end, but you sequence rather two ends. So, but you don't know what is in between. Right? And actually, you don't know the distance between those reads. It follows some normal distribution, roughly speaking, with, with the mean of 500, 400 or so. And the range is around uh, 200, 1,000 base pairs. So we know some information. But as soon as we align on the reference genome, we'll separately perhaps align this end and this end. And we can calculate what is the distance right? and check if those distances follow certain distribution. And, and is that distribution expected? So that's kind of a QC quality control step where you will, you will make sure things are as expected. Okay, so, uh, so genome, right? So we're gonna use the reference. So reference genome will be stored in FASTA format. And um, and that this is the format like this, right? So we, we discussed that, right? So uh, you will have a name of the reference, like for example, chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, and so on. So that's the file 
the human genome file. So it's, it will be three trillion, right? Uh, sorry, billion, three billion nucleotides and meaning three, roughly speaking, three billion letters, right? So it will be quite large file. Um, and there are different reference. So when people say reference, they say also say the version, right? So people keep improving the reference. So I think it used to be for a while HD19, which is outdated. And I think the new one is called HD, human genome, HD38, right? So it's keep, keep improving. It's because people work hard to fill the gaps. And then as I mentioned, they succeeded quite a bit recently in the telomere to telomere consortium where they claim they got like 99, 99 or something like that human genome. So there is almost no gaps left, right? So when you hear the reference, that's just like international consortium, international effort to get one human genome will be very accurate and people keep improving. That's, that's why we have versions or releases. Okay. So however, the reads will be stored in the fast Q format. So you can appreciate the difference, right? That was FASTA and this is fast Q. So the reason Q stands for quality, right? You can have kind of faster, but you also have the quality. And we discussed that the quality is the threat score and that given by the machine, how confident the machine is that the particular base is correct. And uh, that's ASCII code. So that's a code basically for the letters. And there's a certain formula there. We'll not go there because there are tools which can kind of assess the quality of your data. So, I mean, you have, I mean, if you're curious, you can read about that. But again, just not to overwhelm you with details. That's just the, the score from the machine, right? And again, like you can rely to that to the certain degree. It's not necessarily extremely accurate, but it gives you some sense that okay, should you trust? And then I think it's up to bioinformatics algorithms, which I develop how to incorporate that score because it's available. But then you need to decide: do you trust that a lot? Do you trust that a little? Right, so it's up to particular bioinformatics algorithms, algorithm to decide that. Okay, so there are many kind of, it was a big history as we go to the next generation sequencing. It's like there is a first generation, second generation, third generation and so on. So there is many, many uh, kind of different attempts being made to sequence and provide the best technology. So far, I would say Illumina was the most successful one because it's very widely used. And more recent efforts like PacBio, right? Pacific Biosciences and Oxford Nanopore, they claim you know, to deliver long reads, which they do. And then as I mentioned, PacBio was quite remarkable because they were able to, uh, to deliver reads with the very low error rate, which is extremely important. I think still Oxford Nanopore, my understanding is that it provides longer reads, so but but then the error rate is very high, twenty percent. But you can look here. So this is what we started. We started with the Sanger sequencing a while ago. There's, I think it's still used because it's extremely accurate. It's like almost like nine. I mean, almost no errors. So it's often used for validation. However, the downside of that you cannot sequence the human genome at once. You need to split it into fragments. So it's expensive, laborious, and not scalable. Right. So people used nowadays more so for validation. So if you need to validate that something is like, you want to check if there is a particular sequence present in the sample, you want to check that you would perhaps do Sanger because you, you, you think, I mean, the Sanger will, will have no errors. So then other technologies appeared like 454 from Roche and Selexa, Ion Torrent, Illumina. So some of them are still around, some of them disappeared. For example, Roche discontinued 454. And I think Selexa also, I think it's a, some technologies actually innovated in some sense. So people say, okay, can I kind of fix it and still put in the market? So one good example is BGI, Beijing Institute, Be, Beijing Genomic Institute from, from, from Beijing, China. And then I think they took Selexa or some version of, of some old technology, they innovated that. And now they provide quite cheap sequencing comparable to Illumina. And they provide good service in the countries, in the developing countries. So, so remember I mentioned uh, our neighbors like Ukraine, where they did human genome, pro I mean, they did national U Ukrainian genome project. So they actually used BGI, not Illumina, because it was cheaper. And I think BGI is actually aggressively taking the market. So as a result, they might subsidize certain projects. So that I think was the, the choice, but Illumina is the most widely used 
very large fraction of all the data being generated nowadays for the sequencing is coming from Illumina. Intorum, that's another technology. Actually, personally, I did internship there 10 years ago, I think, maybe a little bit less, nine years ago. So when they were just starting. And then it's interesting to observe that the sequencing technology, because as they make claims, you know, like as they work with the toy examples, not real data, they say, okay, we can do better. We can like beat Illumina, provide better quality. However, as you do things, you realize there is physical limitations, which some of them can be overcome and some unfortunately cannot. And that was the case for Antorrent. I think they were not able to increase the read length as well as reduce the error rate. And error rates were, was quite strange and I think higher than Illumina. So people did not adopt it. So Illumina remains the most widely used technology. So I think the new technology like Pug by Oxford Nanopore, they challenge the status of Illumina especially for the application where you need really have where you really need long reads. I think downside, let's say bug buyer, right? It provides comparable error rate for Illumina, but longer read length, but it's it's more expensive, right? So so unless you really need long reads, you 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 I mean you can go with bug buyer, but if you want to scale, meaning you want to sequence a lot of samples, probably Illumina will be a better choice, right? So for the given budget, you would probably sequence more samples with Illumina than Pugby. So if people, if you talk about assembling what we just mentioned, uh, population-based, right, genome, for example, you, you, you take a country, let's say Puerto Rico, as they did, and say, okay, I want to assemble the new genome, I mean, the genome from, from those individuals from that country. So perhaps you would take combination, right? You would take Illumina and Pugby and perhaps Nan Oxford Nanopore, so that long, long reads can, can help you to resolve the repeats. So, and then it's a very active market. So people keep trying to deliver better technology, which are cheaper or work faster and people optimizing different things. So that I know there are many startups trying to, to, to bring the cost of Illumina down because it's still a big barrier for, for adopt, to adopt Illumina in, in, in clinical settings because it's still several hundred dollars, $500 per sample. So that's still expensive to do it routinely. And people try really kind of to do it really massive, like to bring the cost down and to speed it up and so on. So there is many different attempts. It's very active area of biotechnology, biotechnological um, uh, companies and biotech companies. Okay, so I think that's all you need to know in general, just to get like, you know, like to know the names. So like you, if you read the literature, you, you kind of understand that what they're talking about, right? So again, Pug by Oxford, Nanopore, long reads, uh, 454, and Torrent selects Illumina short reads, and Sanger is kind of historical, right? So it's, I don't believe it's used routinely, but rather for validation, right? So that's more or less, you know, like I think if you remember that, you 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 will be good, like reading the literature, right? Because as, as reading the papers, you, you need to know kind of that, those terms and more or less appreciate what, what is the technology. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, so uh, so yeah, so next generation sequencing kind of the same, you know, on the surface, on the high level, is the same as next generation. I mean, as RNA sequencing, right? A whole genome sequencing. You do DNA extraction, you do library preparation, you do next generation sequencing, and you do analysis interpretation, right? That's always kind of the same, and the, the difference is library preparation, right? So if you do RNA seq, you do one library preparation because you need to, to take RNA seq and convert that to cDNA and so on. So there is a special library preparation. If you do whole genome data, you do another library preparation. And if you do whole exome data, when you want only to capture genes, basically, right, you would do a, a different one. So you will design the caption, which only takes the reads which are coming from genes. And, and actually, there is a different one called um, targeted sequencing. Sometimes it's, it's quite often applied in uh, in cancer, and then it's, I think it's called, sometimes it's called onca-panel. So it's even shorter version of whole exome. So instead of saying, I will sequence all whole exomes, you say, I will design the caption, I will capture so-called cancer relevant genes. You decide what is the set of the genes you're mostly interested in and what, let's say, uh, the most relevant to the cancer, and you would design such caption, which will capture only those, those genes. So it's, for example, in, uh, we are collaborating with uh, with Dana Farber Institute at Harvard. So for example, they routinely implemented that. So for every patient coming into Dana Farber with diagnosed with cancer, they would do 
uh, on panel for that person. I think before immunotherapy or like like another therapy and after. So it's quite, and then they they do like they they look at somatic mutation, uh, they look at uh, germline mutation and things like that. So but so but that's I'm saying is like so across the globe in certain locations and like let's say if you have more uh, money possibilities, you know like that's happening. That's happening that the sequencing becomes a routine thing. And then when they implemented that, they actually got the choice. Would you do genotyping? So genotyping is a traditional technology where before sequencing, and it's kind of similar to micro, right? In some, some degree, so it's a chip. And, um, and, and for example, if you do any sort of 23 me, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you heard 23 me on ancestry, like those services, which tells you the ancestry and your predisposition to diseases. So that is done on the chips. Right, that's done using genotyping, where you would just look at the certain SNPs, you know, the certain position in your human in the human genome, but you would not look everywhere. You just look at the million positions, which are the most distinct between individuals. Did anybody do here in the class 23 and me or ancestry? Okay, so yeah, I think it's cost like hundred dollars. So and then it gets gives you the data and then gives you like your ancestry and it tells you like how much you admix and so on. So I think it's a little bit less interesting in Moldova because or like Ukraine or Eastern Europe, and actually the Europe in general because people if even people are mixed, but it's hard to track how. But in US, it's kind of very interesting. If people don't know if they're half Sweden, let's say half German. I mean, or like something like this, you know, 23 mil will really tell you that. So, because that admix was recent and there is kind of a reference you can compare to, right? Because, yeah, so, so people do that a lot. So, and then it's uh, like chips. I mean, the genotyping is quite not expensive comparable to the sequencing, but it's limited in terms of information. So coming back to the Sonka panel. So at the Dana Farber Institute, it was a decision made that okay, let's do better onca panels, a little bit, cheap, a little bit more expensive than um, the genotyping, but it will give us more information, right? So that that was the claim, and uh, and there is a, a lot of startups nowadays also trying to replace gen genotyping, right? The chip with the sequencing. So what they do about that the sequencing is expensive. They say okay, let's do low coverage. Right, let's do 2x coverage. So when we say 2x, so we expect on average your genome will be covered by two reads, right? By one, two, three, and so on. So on average it will be two. So then you can say, okay, but but what about the errors, right? It will be so hard to differentiate the errors from, from real biological signals. So this is what bioinformatics can help. And there is so-called process imputation, so which helps you comparing to the public data, it helps you. To identify the SNPs. And the idea is very simple that some SNPs are correlated, right? For, for, for because of linkage, disequilibrium equilibrium, and things like that in genetics. So, so that's actually very helpful. So if because of the low coverage, you observe only one read, but you don't, I'm sorry, you observe one SNP, but you don't observe another SNP, you can infer that because you know they're correlated. So you look at the public data, say, I always see this SNP together with this SNP. They're always together. You look at your data and you see one SNP and say, okay, this SNP should be here. So you impute it. And then it tends to, it's actually was shown to be similar accuracy as genotyping or even better. So again, that's very active area of research. And uh, in terms of, I think, making the genetic screening of the population, it's, it's important question, which technology would you choose? What coverage would you choose? What read length would you choose? How you make it scalable and so on. So those are very, much not yet well defined, <clears throat> even in the US and like Western Europe. So that's happening right now. People are deciding how we can leverage the technology, advances of the technology, so that we can make large scale screenings of the population in terms of gen genetic predisposition across the diseases. Okay, so just like to recapitulate what we, we, we discussed yesterday, right? So we have Illumina, and uh, which are again short reads low error rate and high throughput typically <clears throat> then we have pack bio long reads low throughput and actually error rate we need to update this plot and this nowadays i think last year they managed to to bring it down so it's comparable to illumina and pack bio 
long reads, uh, long read length, perhaps longer than pack bio, low throughput. How, and however, the error is still very high. Okay, so um, yeah, so if you want to put numbers, um, so throughput, just to summarize, so long read sequencing technology like PacBio and Nanopore has less throughput, produce less reads than the short reads technologies. Error rate, typically long reads technology has a long, larger error rate comparable to the short one, but it's changing, right? As I mentioned, PacBio will have comparable error rate with Illumina. And then, so if you want like some, some numbers, so read length for Illumina, it's up to 150 for this particular machine. Pack by is around 10, 15 KB. And actually Nanopore is quite large, right? 900 KB, right? So it's very long reads. Number of reads. Um, so Illumina will give you 5 million reads uh, at least. You know, like, but that's, I mean, can be like more, can be 50 million if you, if you do that. So, and back by, you can see not, not that much, right? 500K, I think they keep improving the throughput, but it's still low. And then, you know, like it's less than a million. That's for sure. Like both sequencing long reads technology, less than a million. So as the, as you run it, right? So you need to, if you want to increase the throughput, you need to pay for 10 samples to, to increase the throughput and make it comparable to Illumina. Processing time, also important. I think Nanopore holds the promise that it will be really fast, you know, like an and portable. You can travel anywhere and sequence people and sequence outbreaks. I think that's that will be certain <clears throat> different interesting application in the future of Nanopore, of trying to predict pandemics in the sense of like looking at the human, I mean, looking at their, uh, like their, the, 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 the locations where it's happening and perhaps looking at the human immune system, for example, and looking at, at, at like um, detecting the, at the pandemics or like the, the exposure to the viruses before there's a manifestation of, okay, so I need to admit somebody else. So there's a manifestation of disease, right? So, so, so there's many, many applications to Nanopore because it's portable, right? You don't need to do it in the lab centralized, but you can rather kind of travel and, and get it, you know, so it's really portable, fits your, fits your pocket. And then it's fast, fast is also important. Um, so PagBuy is actually also fast, it's up to 10 hours and, and the Lumina, as you can see, it's quite, quite long, right? Because there is many steps to be done and so on, right? So it's, it's running quite a bit. Okay, so admit. okay, so error rate. So um, yeah, so 5, 15%, there's a different estimate, but I think up to 20%. And PacBio recently did it 1%, which was a remarkable progress and nobody actually believed that will happen, but it did happen. And Illumina less than 1% error rate. Cost per run. Um, yeah, so actually let's see. So this, I think this is a little bit outdated. So yeah, I think Illumina is really now much cheaper. So yeah, so I would discard this. So somehow, yeah, sorry about that. So that's not exactly correct. So so I think, yeah, so Illumina is typically uh, cheaper and pack bias. I think it's really tricky here, kind of how you present the data because, you know, like even though pack bias is, 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 is be maybe cheaper, but then you get so little throughput, right? So, so depends how you compare. Do you compare per run or do you compare per base? You know what is the price per base, but it's changing. It's very hard to track. All those tables they are relevant to some degree. You know, like like things that keep. That's another challenge to keep up with the literature or keep up with the technology. They keep changing. You know, like and there are some remarkable changes like PackBio. This table is outdated because PackBio is nowadays is one percent. Okay, so another thing, very important one. What about the price of the machine, right? I think there are two models people use. Either they buy the machines for the institutions, let's say, and then they keep sequencing. Or there are centers where you can send your samples and, and sequence, right? So there are two models. And then actually what do I do observe some centers are excellent, for example, here in California. So at UCLA, it's like excellent center for sequencing, like com quite competitive cost, turnaround time and so on. But actually, unfortunately, where I am right now at UC, it's not. So actually we compare the prices at university itself and some companies 
and the company was providing cheaper price. So we did send to the company rather than the university. So and that's one model where you just like prepare your sample and send it and they will do all the work. Uh, and, and another one is to buy the machine. So if you're interested to buy the machine, you can see that the price is quite different. So it's between $1,000 and a million, almost a million dollars, right? So it's a big, big difference. Um, the reason I think aluminum machine is so expensive because it's complex. There is a camera there, there's a reagent, like there's so many, many things. Park buy is like in between, right? But, but remarkably, Nanopore is really, really cheap. So I think they were distributing those devices even for free or something like very cheap, right? So that's, I think that's, that's interesting. And then, you know, like, like if they bring, I guess the price down per sample, that's, that will be the breakthrough because many, many applications will be fine with that high error rate. I'm not sure if they can bring the error rate personally, that's my opinion. Not sure, but hope, I hope so. Um, so advantages, you know, like some highly accurate, that's Illumina. Uh, and I think Pug Bio nowadays, again, we need to update this table. It's highly accurate and, and sequence long reads. Uh, I think what advantage of the Nanopore, extremely long reads, right? Like very long reads and portable. That sometimes is very important. Um, so, okay. Okay, so as you compare them across the applications, so um, so alignment will be typical for the short reads and that will be quite easy to do. People have worked on that many, many, many years. And I think there are 120 tools being developed. So based on our recent review. So there is many, many of the tools being developed. We'll be using one. Um, and there are interesting kind of comparisons. So when you do align short reads, they have low error rates so things are easy, you know, like you find the location, but sometimes it's hard because you might have multi-mapped reads, meaning the reads are mapped to the several locations on the, in the genome. So why is that? Why would you have a read which is mapped in here in the genome and here in the genome? Any ideas? So you, you sequence your genome, right? You got your reads, you take a read and you take a reference. And let's say you know how to do it, so you align. And you see, okay, this read, the same read is perfectly mapped or whatever, very nicely mapped here and identically mapped somewhere else. Why would, why would that be? So it's actually repeats, right? Remember from, from biology, so repeats, right? The human genome has a long stretch of DNA, which is exactly the same and located far away from each other, right? So that means if you sequence that repeat, that read will be perfectly matching this repeat and that repeat. So, and then you will be not able to differentiate where the read is coming from, right? So we call those reads multi mapped reads. You can probabilistically assign them, but it's hard. So the long reads, the chance that will happen is, is, is much lower because they are long. So probably they might span the entire repeat, you know, like they might cover the repeat and something else. So you find the location because as soon as you're within the repeat, right? As soon as the read is inside the repeat, you cannot differentiate. But as soon as you go uh, go beyond the repeat and you capture some unique information of DNA, then you can find the location. So, however, especially for nanopore, given high error rate, it's hard to know exactly how it's mapped locally, right? So you know it's it mapped here somewhere in the genome, but how it's mapped locally exactly? That's a little bit hard because so many errors. So sometimes you don't know, are those errors? Are those in DELs, insertion deletions? Like what's going on? So as more errors you get, obviously it's harder it is. Um, assemble novel, in this case, it's not novel transcripts, but assemble novel genome. Again, that's impossible to, due to the repeats. If you just run Illumina and you say, okay, I want to reconstruct my genome not using the reference, you will fail. However, if you combine if you take your sample and you sequence Illumina, you take Pugbuyer and you take Nanopore, perhaps you will succeed. And actually we have one active project on that. So we tried to sequence, we got some, some funding for that from Saudi Arabia. So we are sequencing some, some genome of some rich guy there. And, and, and then it's interesting, it's like it's open question, which combination of technology we should use to, to assemble that genome without reference. But it's an open question. There's very few attempts on that. Okay, so now tool compatibility. Um, 
So most bioinformatics tools are designed to work with the short reads, and but some of them do support third generation long reads like PugBio and Nanopore, and some so some of them support both. So this is kind of the technology and number of tools, right? So this is the number of tools designed for the particular technology. So, and you can see there is a little bit more than just Illumina. There is um, the next genomics, there's PugBio and Nanopore will not go there. So, I mean, one thing I think you want to take from this that, you know, like generally when the tools are developed, they in develop with the envision of certain technology, right? And, and then as technology changed dramatically, the tools becomes outdated. And there is different models. Some tools keep up. They try to make a new releases all the time and, and then make it work for any new technology. Some tools say, okay, our tool will only work for short reads and we don't care about long reads. And some people say, I don't care about short reads. I will directly develop for the long reads, right? So, so there are many, many tools like that and people make different decisions. Um, so I think when you look at the data, let's say of the public data, you can actually see what exactly was the instrument uh, being used for, to produce this data. And actually, if you generate the data and you would upload the data and share it publicly, you would be asked this kind of question. What was the instrument used? Was it paired, for example, right? Was it the source? Was it like like here? I think you can read it a little bit already, right? You you have some 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 background already. So let's read it. So name, okay, so some name, then instrument, right? So we say Lumina Nova six six thousand, whatever that instrument is, right? Now, so we kind of know, okay, Lumina. So we know what to expect. Short reads, right? So that's what we say. Okay, low error rate. Okay, good. Now strategy, whole WGC meaning whole genome data. Okay, so that's something when we sequence the entire genome, not just the genes, not just the exons, but like the entire genome. Source, genomic, yeah, makes sense because whole genomes data will be genomic. Uh, I'm not sure about so selection, random, uh, maybe the primers, I'm not sure. So layout, paired, meaning the paired entries, right? So, so that's kind of like what that sample is. Uh, okay, so that's genome sequencing of some cells, and there is some explanation what they did here. Uh, reagents, which reagent key did they use? So, so right, so people upload the data, they kind of describe, and then there is a unique SRA number, SRA, SRR, whatever the number that's unique identifier of that particular data, and number of bases. So it's the, the size, thirty-two point four gigabytes. So it's quite large file. I mean, that's sorry, that's number of bases, right? So this is number of bases and the size is up to almost 10 gigabytes. So anyways, it's quite large. Published very recently, right? Actually, while we were doing the course. Okay, so, right, so that's kind of like, you know, like that's like knowledge you have got helps you to read and understand what is the data, right? Um, okay, any questions? Okay, so um, I remember we discussed the metadata. Metadata is a big issue and very important when you're reusing the data, right? Let's say you, you say, I want to study certain disease or, or certain condition or anything. And you say, I would like to identify the public data. And perhaps it will be enough public data for you to pursue the project with no additional sequencing effort. Some, it's quite often the case. Um, and you can actually look in such a raw format, uh, which you will get from the SRA website. So, you know, like um, that's a, just an alternative way to read. So basically what you saw like there on the webs, in the web kind of format or like on, on the web, you know, like as the tables and like it can be also saved in, in, in different formats. So I would say just like for information to know, that's also the possibility, but I think more or less you can get everything from, from there. So what is the advantage of, of downloading kind of the raw metadata is that if you have many samples, I think perhaps it's not that easy to do it manually. So I think that will be the motivation for you why you would need to download raw data. And I think it's JSON format, which can drop tools to convert it to CSV if you prefer CSV. Um, so again, that's important if you do thousand samples and that's becomes thousand studies, let's say, and then becomes challenging to check them manually one by one. Rather, you want to combine them in a single CC file and, and check, some, check, for example, what was distribution of sequencing platform, what was the distribution of the phenotypes and things like that, right? 
Okay. So again, read alignment. Um, just to put uh, again the definition. So read alignment is um, you you got the, your reads derived from individual genome, but you don't know that genome. And um, and what you want to do, you want to align, you want to place those reads onto the reference genome. Um, and the goal of read alignment is to find the section of the genome that matches, and very importantly, sometimes nearly matches the read sequence, right? So you got your sequence read and you place it on the human genome. And sometimes it's a perfect match, meaning every single base is the same. And sometimes it's nearly perfect match. So can somebody tell me why there is why it would be nearly perfect match? Why it's not always the perfect match? I think you know the answer. There are, yeah. There are individual mutations in genome. Exactly. That's one reason. Exactly. So you will have because your the error rate of uh, exactly. machine. Yeah, exactly. So two reasons, right? Either uh, that's the individual SNPs or errors. And then you, you actually need to differentiate between them. But those two fundamental reasons. OK. Um, so let's see. So let's get some definitions, right? So let's say we have a reference genome here in pink. Now we have mapped reads. So let's say we have run the bioinformatics algorithm, and we see that. Uh, so we see that we are able to map the reads which are in yellow. Okay. So we will refer position of the read, right? Position of the read in the reference genome where it's made, mapped. It's quite simply determined because reference genome represented as the string of letter A, C, T, G, obviously. And every letter will have a position from starting from one, one, two, three, four billion, I mean, million, 100 million, and so on, right? So, and then you would split by chromosome. So to the position of the read will be chromosome number and the position, I mean, the, the in that chromosome. So that's read position. Uh, coverage. Coverage will be just the number of reads covering that position. So for example, if you ask the coverage, what is the coverage of the very first position here, it will be one. The second position will be two, three, four, 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 four for a while, right? So you just count, basically kind of put the needle if you want in that position and count number of reads overlapping that position. So when we say coverage in G, that's coverage per base, right? Like it, uh, of the particular base of the genome. But typically we say about average coverage. So um, to get it, so we have a formula. So you need to calculate number of bases of all mapped reads, basically number of those squares here, or in your data, number of nucleotides, right? Number of letters, which, com which compose the reads. Number of bases of all mapped reads and divide by the basis of the reference genome. So you know that number, I think 3.3 uh, billion nucleotides, right? So, so in this case, we can actually calculate the coverage. So what we do, we count number of squares. So if you do that, you will actually notice that's 120 squares. And you divide it by 50 because the number of bases here is 50. So you got 2.4 coverage. So our genome was covered on average 2.4 by 2.4 reads. And people say 2.4x coverage. Now, what that means? That on average is covered by 2.4 reads, right? So for example, some you may notice that some bases are not covered at all. And some are highly covered by four reads. I think the max, right? The max is four reads. Some bases are covered with one read, like two reads and three reads, right? So we have a quite a variability, but on average, that's 2.4. So that's very typical for real data. You never get like the straight line. The coverage will be, if somebody tells you, like nowadays whole genome data will be, let's say 16X coverage. Like say, okay, I've got 16 S coverage. So what? Can, how can you read that information? You say that that means that on average, the human genome in that sequence experiment was covered by 16 reads. But it doesn't mean that every single position is like it's a straight line, not at all. So some position will be covered by five reads. Some of them perhaps will be not covered and some will be covered with more reads, right? So there is some, some different, I mean, the coverage, it's like differs, I mean, fluctuates across, across the genome. Um, another way to calculate the coverage is actually to count number of reads and multiply by the read length. 
right? That's a different way to calculate number of bases which are mapped, right? Take number of take number of mapped reads and multiply by the read length. The downside of that approach is sometimes reads are not exactly uh, the same length for various reasons. Um, so, for example, if you think of Illumina being 100, yes, majority of the reads will be perhaps 100, but some reads will be like 90, some maybe a little bit 101. And there are two reasons for that. So reason number one is from sequencing machine. Sequencing machine can give 100, but sometimes it truncates a little bit. Maybe the quality didn't go well or something. And also if you do quality control step, and you remember that like, like those box plots where you see the thread scores goes down and you cut the reads, certain reads, for example. So if you do cut the reads because you, you're not happy about the quality of the end of the read, that will result in some reads to be shorter. So, right, so that's, 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 so that's why you cannot assume kind of typically that it's a hundred or like any, 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 any other read length. But, but typically, if you want to do kind of a rough estimate, if you don't care about the really precise number, but rather you want to get idea, that's, I think, fine. You know, like you can assume that it's 100 on average, and you can just multiply 100, let's, I mean, yeah, 100 read length multiplied by the number of mapped reads. That's, that's okay. You know, but if you want really precise number, then you need to calculate the number of bases precisely. Okay, so, so what is throughput? So, so throughput, is number of bases of all the reads, right? So if you look at your fastq file, you need just to count number of letters in ACTG, right? That will give you the throughput. So in our case, the throughput is 150 base pairs. So you can see there is a difference between 150 and 120. 120 is the number of mapped reads, and this is all of them are here, right? But, uh, but it's not. 150. So what happened to 30 ba uh, like 30 base uh, 30 uh, base pairs? So what happened? They were not mapped. So we call them unmapped reads. So you can see them in the in blue. So so why is that? <laughs> Again, several reasons for that. So reason number one, maybe they have too many mismatches, right? If the read has too many mismatches the aligner will be not able to confidently say where the read is coming from and will say, I give up, I cannot do that. That happens sometimes. But there is actually, if you remember the very first, first module, we talked about um, what are, like we talked about repurposing the technologies. I mentioned a couple of work we do. So, so there are more biological reasons for the unmapped reads. And, and some of them, um, maybe those reads are coming from the novel regions in the human genome, right? Not yet present in the reference. So if you think the reference is a little, I mean, it's incomplete to a certain degree, right? Which perhaps is the case. So some reads coming from those regions will be not mapped because they are not present in the reference. Actually, it was, I think, some claim being made again about ancestry and ethnicity, you know, like if you take individuals from Africa, they will have more unmapped reads because the reference suits them worse. You know, like the reference doesn't represent African population that well as the reference represents Europeans, right? So that's indication perhaps that you need population, bay, I mean, population specific reference for African individuals, let's say, right? But that's fundamentally biological reason, right? If there is no that, that they, if there is a region not present in the reference, the reads and the reads are coming from that region, you cannot map those reads, right? From, like, there is no way. There is also like different reason, like what I mentioned about T and B cell receptors. So if you think about the T and B cells, they will have their own genomes in some sense. And because there is recombinations uh, of, VDJ, of, of VDJ genes, and, and then the, the, that's a novel sequences. So I think it's like, it was interesting, actually interesting to observe like how in times of COVID, I think it was claims being made if you're vaccinated, right? You'll get new DNA. And then it's in partly, it's kind of true because you get novel recombination, right? You get the immune boost and then adaptive immune system will produce novel recombinations, right? So like it's a novel DNA, but not really what we mean by, by like by inserting new DNA in you. But, 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 but like that's another reason, right? So if you, if you have a particular VDJ recombination on the of on the surface of the T cells or B cells, that is not part of the reference genome. So if read is coming from there, then then it will be not mapped. And then the B cells and T cells typically are part of the 
of the sample to the various degree. If you take blood, there's many T cells. If you take PBMC, there's even more, and so on, right? So, okay. So I think those are fundamental definitions, right? Like when you read the literature, you know, read the paper about sequencing, they will mention some of them will map number of map reads, number of throughput, number of coverage, and so on, right? Any questions here? Okay, I hope that is clear. So, okay, I think we will skip RNA secrets because we have covered that yesterday. Um, okay, so, so we have, you know, like, like fundamentally, when we talk about read alignment, we have um, alignment of two sequences, right? So we have very long one, which is your human genome. And we have very short one, which is the read, right? Now we do the alignment. So it's a very classical bioinformatics problem, how you align two sequences. And the global alignment will mean that, you know, you want to map this in a way that, you know, like, like you, stray, you start from the beginning to the end, right? So like you take one string and you want to stretch your string across. Because you assume they, they should like globally match. Or local alignment, you say, I don't care about like mapping my short sequencing to the longer one. I just care to find that some region in that long sequence where my short sequence will match. And this is so to us, local alignment will be more relevant in that sense. Uh, because we have found what is that? A W, I think here, right? A W G H. Yeah. So we found this region in the input kind of human genome where that particular string matches. But actually, it's not. We are not able to match all the strings. That's also very important. We are not able to match all the strings. We are just able to match some part of it. So we don't know, for example, where P is coming from. Okay, so that's kind of how it started. Again, don't. I don't think. It just like this is more like for your background. So this is how it started. People were mapping, I mean, aligning sequencing one to another for a very long time. So, but then next generation sequencing came and actually challenged this because they said, you know what, we have so many of them. We have very long human genome, but we have millions and millions uh, reads. So we cannot do anything traditional. We need to come up with the fast algorithms. Um, so yeah, so, and that's another, again, thing for your background multiple sequence alignment when you have multiple sequence you want to align them to each other and traditionally that was dust done using the blast and 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 you know like an alignment is visualized like this so what we'll be talking about is will be a little bit different uh from from traditional multiple sequence alignment again because you cannot put all the reads together and the human genome and say okay can you do multiple sequence alignment one because the reads are much shorter than the genome, right? And that will not work because you would assume when you do multiple sequence alignment, but more or less the sequence you do multiple alignment, they are more or less the same length. So that will not work. So then another approach you say, okay, how about I remove the genome and just take the reads, right? And they will be perhaps more or less the same length. That will also not work because some of them will match because they're coming from the same region of the human genome, some of them will not match. So you cannot make this beautiful kind of metrics or whatever you call it, right? So that will not work. But but it was kind of like how it started, right? So people have looked the local and global alignments, they have looked at multi multi sequence alignment and thought, okay, can we design something better, which is suitable for this particular technology, which is next generation sequencing. Okay, so as you run the tool right and the tool will will use a quite complicated heuristic which will not go there very much you know like so it will basically you know like what you need to understand it will try hard for every read to find using sophisticated different algorithms to find the location in the genome so what is the biggest challenge for bioinformatics the biggest challenge to make it fast because if you do it slow i mean you know, it's not that hard. So what you do, you need to take a read and try every possible position in the human genome, right? Take a read and try position one, no, position two, no, position three, no, and so on. Oh, you found it. Take another read. 
but that will be too expensive in terms of computation. So, you know, like think like this, you have, let's say 10 million reads and then the length of the human genome is 3 billion. So for every read, you need to compare, you need to examine 3 billion positions. So you need to multiply 3 billion by 100 million. This will be a huge number. And I doubt any, like you will run it in a reasonable time. You can implement this algorithm quite fast, probably in a day. It's very straightforward to run, to write, but it will not, I mean, it will work, but it works for years. So that's not something we want. So people have worked a lot how to design a kind of smart data structures so that you can, you don't need to run it, you know, like examine every single position because it's too expensive, too computation expensive. So, and then what people, so, and again, we'll not go much what people did, but they basically design such structures where things are like, you can do that instead of doing 3 billion comparison, you could do it like in, in what is called constant time. So you just need one comparison. Okay. So that's the whole branch of bioinformatics, which will not go there. So instead we will take advantage of that tools exist and we can use them. Okay, so as you run the tool, right, which will give you a little line. So the, what the tool does, it will report the best position in the genome of every single read. Some reads, it will fail. Let's say, I am not able to find anything, any position that it is mapped to. So I, the tool will say it's unmapped read. But for the rest of the reads, it will tell where and how. Where means where precisely in the human genome that it is coming from and how like what are the mismatches, what are the indels, what is the score and so on. Okay, so this is the sum and, the, and then all their read alignment tools have agreed that uh, the, the format output of read alignment will be SAM or BAM format. SAM, SAM, sequence alignment mapping, that's what it stands for. And BAM, just the binary version of that, just to save the space, right? So when you do text, it's not very effective way to store, but if you do binary, that is more effective. So the downside, I think Sam, you can open more or less as the text, you know, in your, let's say anything, you know, like, like, a, like you know, just using the text viewer. However, the BAM format, you need specific tools to open the BAM format, which are, which are available. Okay, so that's what the Sam will look like. And I think we will have slides kind of to discuss. Um, we'll come back to it. So, but then roughly speaking here, every line will be a read, right? So you see read one, two, three, four, read three again, actually, and read one. So I think just looking at the very first column, you can appreciate that, let's say if we have what? If we have four reads, right? So all of them were mapped, let's say. However, there is interesting observation that the read um, number three is repeat, it's reported twice. So why would be that? So why, why the aligners will report read three twice? Any ideas? It found it two matches. Exactly, it's multi-mapped read, exactly. So it's multi-mapped reads and then the aligners just don't know. I think it's, it's mapped quite well to reference, you know, like, I mean, whatever the reference is at position nine, that's a position and then a position 29. Okay, so I mean, there are more details here, so we'll, we'll go there in a second, but like you already can start understanding what is the FASM format. Okay, so this is a BAM version just to save space, right? So um, in the binary format, and then if you open that, will not help you. If you open that using the, uh, how should I say, if you, you, if you do that using the SAM tools, that, that will not work. Okay, so, um, all right, so let's see. Okay, so I'm just looking at the time. Okay, so maybe we have another five minutes and I think we, we can stop here. Okay, so interpreting SAM and BAM alignment section, right? So um, here we have, so this is what the SAM and BAM alignment will look like. Right, so we have reads, the name of the read, read one, read two, and read three. Then we have multiple fields, but I would, you know, pay your, I mean, 
pay on, like pay attention to the ones which are highlighted. So name of the reference genome, right? So for example, it's chromosome one, chromosome two, and chromosome three. So this is where the read is mapped to. So the read number one is mapped to the human chromosome one. The read number two is mapped to the human chromosome two, and uh, read number three is also mapped to the human chromosome two. Then you have a number, and that number is positioned in the reference genome where the read reads are aligned. Okay. Then you have a cigar. So you have. Uh, so what is cigar? So cigar is this is how the read is mapped. Is it all bases of the read is mapped, or perhaps some bases are mapped and some bases are unmapped or of these insertions and deletions. So that's exactly the case here. So how you can read it? So M means match, I means insertion, and M means match, right? So you can read it from the left to the right, and you say 18 bases of that read are mapped, are matched, right? So there is a match. Then you say there is a one insertion in that read, and there is another 52 bases being mapped. And that insertion can be the error of the sequencing machine, or perhaps can be true in Dell, I mean, true insertion, um, true variants of that particular individual. It can be deletions. So the read number two will have three matches, then one deletion, and 68 matches. Okay. So meaning that that deletion can be again true deletion or can be just artifact of the sequencing. And here we have last read on read number three, 38 matches, one insertion and 46 matches. Okay, so then you have a sequence of the read being reported, right? So that's the basic information and there is something else as well, but this is the basic information about the SAM or BAM alignment section, right? Because again, SAM and BAM are the same file. The difference is SAM you can open with text editor and BAM you need specialized tools. Okay, so a little bit more on SIGAR. So just a way to represent additional bases of the read, which are not in the reference or maybe missing bases of the read that are in the reference, right? So basically just think representing insertions, representing deletions, primarily, or for example, you are not able to match the first part of the read. So you would say soft clipping. So I think we'll, we'll have some details here. Okay, so there is some uh, abbreviations here. And um, let's see. So actually, if you don't mind, so let's make, because I need to, actually I do have the chargers. Yeah, so never mind. Because I, sorry about that. So oops, it was working. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, okay, so we'll let's spend a little bit more time here. Okay, so let me put more full screen here. Okay, so, so we have a couple of things here, right? So we have matches, we have deletions, insertions, we have skipped regions, we have soft clipping and hard clipping, right? So those are the letters how you would express the alignment. So matches is simple, right? There is a match between the base from the read to the, um, to, to the reference. Deletions, means there is something, and I'm always confused. So I think Cynthia might clarify that. So, because deletion is relative, right? So when we say deletion, I think that means deletion in the read, but we will confirm that. So, so deletion, so there is something deleted in the read comparable to the reference, right? Because it can be vice versa. It can be something deletion in the reference comparable to the read, right? So they are kind of interchangeable, the insertions and deletions. So I believe that deletion in the read so there is some base deleted in the read comparable to the reference and insertion, there is some insertion in the read comparable to the reference, but we will double check it. Then skipped region, there is a region of nucleotides not present in the read, but present in the reference and soft clipping. Uh, so basically you cannot map beginning or the end of the read and you would remove them and say, maybe they are not true or you just don't find the match, right? So, and then you say, that's my big duty technological reasons. For example, there are no adapters being removed from the read or I don't know, there's a bad quality in the end of the read. So, and there's 
not i think you 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 i think for your purposes soft clipping and hard clipping will be kind of the same there is no much difference i think there will be some difference how the read is represented i think soft clipping um when you see the read sequence in the file the the the, the basis will be there and hard clip the basis will be not there but but essentially what the tool is telling you that it doesn't know how to align that region from the read. And typically, it's only in the beginning and end of the read. OK, so some examples which we kind of discussed. But um, so 18M, 1I, 52M, 18 matches, one insertion, and then 52 matches, right? Um, so another one, three matches, one deletion, 32 matches, right? So this is how you read it, right? So, so that's kind of the very basic. Um, okay, so, and again, that's what you will be looking at, right? You will be looking at this kind of files you want to learn. So there are a few objectives of this module. You want to learn how to operate the um, read alignment tools, but also more importantly, you want to know how to interpret the results, right? You want to look how to read at the raw data or aligned, better say, map, how to look at the map reads. To, to examine the quality of the read alignment. And again, so if you see this kind of line, that's your interpretation, right? You see the name of the read, you see that it's mapped on the chromosome one, and you see this is how it mapped, right? 18M, 18 matches, one insertion, and then 52 matches, right? So this is how you interpret that. And, um, okay. There's another read like this. So, okay, there's another read mapped to the chromosome two, and there is three matches, one deletion, 32 matches. Okay. Uh, okay, so the tool will be using its BWA. Um, there's many, many tools. As I mentioned, there's 120 or so tools, but that's perhaps the most popular one. Um, but in general, each tool will have its advantages, limitations, so on. But I think if you're using BWA for your analysis, it's quite a reasonable choice of the tool. Uh, OK, so what you will do with Cynthia or with other TA today, so you will download the reference and sequences to align. Uh, if you have um, Git installed, then you can do just Git clone the BWA tutorial Git, right? So you will download the data you need. And again, we will not be working with the real human data, I mean, with the real reference and so on, because it will be too much, I guess, right? So it's too large. So we'll give you some some, some simulated reads, so which are like real reads, but smaller, so you can handle them. Um, and actually, we'll be not even using human. Um, uh, you will not be even using human, uh, some, I mean, the human genome. We will also be using HIV reference, right? Um, so what we'll say if we sequence human samples, so we want to see other HIV reads uh, in the human sample, right? So, so let's say this will be our reference, all right? So we'll be mapping the reads from the sample to HIV reference, uh, which technically is the same. You know, given the reference, you want to know where the reads from the samples are aligned to. So this is, will be your reference, HIV reference, faster. You could look at that, it's quite short because it's a virus, right? So it's short reference. And then human sample RNA fast, right? So we'll get uh, we'll get the reads uh, being stored in that faster file. So remember, uh, yeah, so those are two files you will use. So what we do, we do LS, right? So LS, as you remember, displays the files for you. So, um, so you know what are the files you're working with. Okay, so um, so this is what we'll be ref using, right? We'll be using the tool called BWA. It's quite it's actually published a while ago, but it's still widely used tool, you know. Like, and then it produces SAM and BAM files, and then actually it's quite nice that there is a quite rigorous trend standards in the field that every single alignment tool will produce a SAM or BAM file. So, for example, if you decide to change. BWA and run something else, it will still work. And then another tool will be using its SAM tools. So the SAM tools is actually can work nicely with the, with the BAM and SAM files. And, 
and then um, and then basically will will let you not just look by eye what you're doing right now, right? You're looking by eye at read and say, okay, what's going on? But rather something code based, right? So you want to, for example, you want to count number of reads per chromosome, so you can do that, or you can say how many reads were perfectly matched with no insertions or deletions. You can get that number, or how many reads were you know like like unmapped and map and things like that so the sam tools will, will really allow, let you do that okay so i think we'll stop here today and we'll take 15 minutes break and we'll see if when tas will come so any questions so far maybe one question at the bit at some point of time so yeah. this reference general Mm -hmm. Yes. Does yeah. it have the beginning? So when they start uh, read alignment, or there is no need for the beginning. So for, for the start, start, starting point, how to say. So I'm not sure if I understand. So you say there is no need what in the reference? Uh, is there, yes, when we have, I understand um, when uh, they, they try to, to make this read alignment, yes, mm -hmm. uh, they, they are based on the reference genome. Yeah. And uh, this reference genome, does it have the start point and the yeah. end point? Yeah. Yes. You, yes. If you can think about this as a normal string. Yes, right? because we have just the string of uh, for, no, for, for letters. Every chromosome, yes. Think like this. You have for every chromosome, you have a string. Yes. And every letter in that string will have a number. One, let, I mean, position one, position two, position three, position four, and so on, position whatever, million something, right? So uh -huh. every base in the chromosome will have a position. So when you map the read, so if you see the read is mapped to the, like this base, you know exactly what is the position, let's say position 10. So you say the read is mapped to the chromosome one at mm -hmm. position 10. So why it's done, it's just done for convenience because you have coordinates. It's very easy then to talk about the reads because you know precisely where they are mapped to. Oh, like. So this uh, reference uh, genome has uh, very well defined some coordinates, so we can. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. So and then and then just like when we say mapping and the alignment, actually it's the same thing. So we'll interchange those terms. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like you know, like like yeah, yeah, everything is well, like that's why it's reference. You know, like it's well annotated. So you know, it's like coordinates. You say you know, for every read, you will know precisely where it's mapped, and then it's just easy to compare and like just work with the data because you know. You know precisely how things where things are and so on and what is would be the final purpose of this uh, work what for do we need to to map yeah so the reads? Very, yeah that, that's a very first step in all next generation sequence an analysis you know like if you need to analyze next generation sequencing data and detect the the, the, the mutations like this, the variants present in the data you would need to run read alignment and generate the BEM file but non, not only to generate it, but to examine it, right? To, to see what, like, it was, was the alignment good or sufficient? You know, like you would examine number of unmapped reads. And if it's too high, that's suspicious. You know, like something around 10% will be fine for the reasons we have discussed. You know, there are some technological reasons, biological reasons. But if you have 30% or 50%, that's might be not right. For example, if you take mice sample from the mouse and you map to the human genome, perhaps 50% of the reads will be mapped. But that's the indication that something went wrong. So that's one. Then number of mismatches. If you have, you know, like some number of mismatches, like think about number of variants you would expect in the individual comparable to the human genome. Let's say a million, you would expect a million SNPs from, from, from you, right? Comparable to the reference genome. On the top of that, you would expect around 1% error rate being distributed kind of randomly across the reads. So that gives you some estimate how much you would expect to observe in the data. And then again, if it's too high, then it's suspicious, right? Like, why is that? Maybe the quality of the data is not good. Maybe something went wrong. So like, it's very important. So it's general, very important to stay very attached to the data, you know, like not be on the high abstraction, but more or less understand what's going on. Like look at the data yourself by eye or through what we will learn tomorrow through, through the SEM tools and so on, you know, like, so that's important. And kind of like, you know, like, like question, almost be like, you know, like on the pessimistic side, say like, okay, like, you know, like, can they find some, something with, with, which went wrong, you know, like, and check out like different aspects and they say, okay, then if you're happy with all the statistics, 
you have uh, collected to say, okay, that's a good file. That's a good BAM file, you know, like, and then that's a good start. I can now run, uh, let's say variant detection and can detect particular variants of that individual or structural variants, whatever the, the scientific questions you have got. But typically read alignment is the beginning of every single bioinformatics analysis you would do with next generation sequencing data. Yes, thank you. Sure. Any, any other questions? Okay, so let's take 15 minutes break. And then, um, yeah, and I think TAs will come and we'll, we'll go from there. So let's get started. So the last lecture today, right? So we are finishing module six, and this is where we stopped, right? So we said that we will cover two different tools, one BWA and one SEM tools. Okay, so, so BWA is the read aligner, right? So it will align the reads from the next generation sequencing machine like Illumina onto the human reference, right? This is what it will do. SAM tools will take the output of the BWA and will help you interpret the data, right? Look in the data because it's complex data, right? Like every read is placed in the reference and there is some features of that read. So rather than looking manually, which you can if the data is small, but typically it's not, so you would need some sort of the tool which will help you look at the data. So some tools is designed for that. Um, so in terms, in terms of installation, so that will be covered in hands-on session and probably already was covered. So there are a few, few possibilities to install. There is Anaconda, I think the best way to install things. So Anaconda is the package man manager, which I mean, what you need to know, it just basically makes your life easy. So you can install tools easy, you know, you will not struggle through installation process, which is sometimes very complex. And so, so what you see here, Anaconda is the, Conda is the name, I guess, Anaconda is like the particular version. So it's like a, or everything and there is mini Conda, smaller number of tools. And, and there is also Bioconda. So those are the tools related to kind of bioinformatics and biology. Okay, so, but all you need to know, you just need to use that. And then that's good or preferable way to install the tools, okay? Okay, so when we run BWA, so what fundamentally we need to do? So we need to create the index of the human genome first, right? So meaning that there is some data structure, as we want to create a data structure which is associated with the human genome so that um, we can do things, you know, like, like so that reference has some, some data structure which, which which will allow to run BWA. Okay, so we run BWA index for that. Um, um, and then we are ready to run, right? We are ready to run uh, the BWA. So we run BWA, that's the name of the tool, right? Then there is an option, MEM. So that's a particular version of BWA, which is recommended to run. So we just follow what is recommended by the developers of the BWA. So then we need to provide two things. Um, we need to provide human sample and the reference, right? So we provide HIV ref, that's a, our reference. This is how it was called because we are mapping the reads on HIV. Right, so, so what we are doing, you know, like, so, I mean, on the high level, so we are taking the human sample, right? And through sequencing, we want to check, does that individual basically is HIV positive? Can we find any reads coming from the virus? Kind of the same approach you can do for COVID, right? You take the nasal swap or any kind of other swap and then sequencing deeply your sample, perhaps you will find viruses. I mean, virus, the, the, the SARS, if the person is infected, and then, so sequencing can be can be done, can be used for that. Um, and then it's quite, I mean, if you think clinically, it's quite interesting approach. And I think it holds the promise because when, when very often then the patients are admitted to the hospital and there is some infection, we don't know exactly what is infection, right? We can perhaps guess, I mean, not guess, but like do some tests, but all we will do, we will say, okay, it sounds like a virus. I mean, it's a virus or the bacteria, but we don't really know the particular species, not talking about the strain, right? So sequencing to do that and, and will tell us somebody is, somebody is accepted with sepsis. So you, instead of doing culture-based approaches, which takes time, like a day or so, 
sequencing can be faster, right? Remember Nanopore, right? So now it's extremely crucial for this type of application to be extremely fast, right? So six hours is very nice and appealing. So we can detect who is there and who is causing the hours and what is the strain. Okay, so that's the motivation. So what we are doing here, we're taking the human sample and we're looking for HIV reads, non-human reads, right? HIV reads. Okay, so again, coming back to command BWM, then you say HIV ref, that's your reference, which was indexed before. And then you say your sample, right? Human sample RNA.FA. So basically when you say the extension of the file can be, you can say FASTA or you can say FA, well, nothing will change. There is no kind of strict requirements how you do extensions. Okay, so, and then you want to redirect, remember that from Unix, right? You want to redirect the output of this command into a file. And the file name will be alignments.sam. It's up to you how you want to name the file. So we decided to call it alignments.sam. Okay. So inside the alignments.sam should be everything about reads which are mapped, right? Okay, so we need just one command, right? To run to read to map the reads on the human gene on the on HIV genome, you just need one command. Okay, so now I think it's better to work in general with the BAM files. I mean, first of all, they're more effective storing the data, but in general, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, we prefer to, to work with the BAM files. Um, so, and we would recommend to you as well. We, so, uh, so some tools, so if you want to convert, right? So you've got the SAM file. So if you want to convert that to the BAM file, so you can, so you exactly run this command. SAM tools view minus S minus B, alignment sam right so just like run those parameters and then you say your file your sam file and again the same story output will be redirected to another file and you call that file alignments.bam okay so this is how you got your file which will be working with two commands okay so the very simple command just to look inside so if you do sam tools view and the name of the files and so if we do bam so remember, BAM is binary. So you cannot just look inside. Rather, uh, you need to have special special tool. And that special tool will be SAM tools. Okay, so say you say SAM tools view alignments.bam. All right. Um, so what you see, what you will see on the screen, you will see read alignments. I mean the BAM file, which we discussed before. So another possibility. Um, is just directly look at the SAM file. That's that's fine, you know. Like so, if you don't want to generate BAM files, you can just open SAM file. And SAM file is just text file. So actually, from the Unix, you already have all the tools to open the file, right? Remember, you can do cat, you can do less, you can do head, you can do tail, things things like that, right? So it's exactly the same. That's why it's important to know Unix when you do work with bioinformatics or the genomics data because you need to have those tools, right? Okay, so it's your choice, you know, like using BAM or SAM. Okay, so once again, just a reminder. So in terms of BAM file, so that's how it will look like, right? We'll have a read name because every read has the name. Then we'll see where the it's mapped to, like the reference. So it's HIV complete genome, right? Since we're mapping to the virus, we'll not have the chromosomes, right? So it's a single genome, quite short one, like what, 10 KB, I guess the full, full, full HIV genome. So very short one comparable to the human. And, um, and they will have a start position whether it is mapped to, right? So it goes to 5,900, right? So it's towards the middle somewhere. And then we have a cigar, right? Cigar, it's how the read is mapped, right? Is there is insertions or there is deletions and how it's mapped and the sequence, which is aligned. Right, the fraction of the reads which we were, we were able to, to align to HIV genome. Okay. Um, so what we can, can conclude, so we say, okay, those are reads are quite nicely mapped, meaning, you know, reads were like 100, no, I guess less, right? They were like around 70 base pairs, I imagine. So you have 18 
matches than one insertion and 52. Actually, six, okay, 70, 70, probably read length, right? Okay, so yeah, so there were 70 base pairs long reads. So that's how Illumina gave it to us. So we were able to map 18 bases, then we have an insertion, then we have 52 matches, and we have three reads, right? So we decided that three reads is enough evidence to, to say that this particular individual is HIV positive. So I think as if you if that's like a toy example, obviously, right? But if you do some real approach for that, you should be probably a little bit more careful. Like maybe three reads is not enough, but you want more reads. But that will be a problem because you know fractionally number of HIV reads probably is quite low, right? Comparable to the human, so you might have actually only three reads, not more than that. So what you do in that case, right? So like for example, you're implementing this protocol in the hospital. You say, okay, we have bought nanoporids or something like this, which which is faster, and we want to detect every patient coming with sepsis into the hospital just to know faster and uh, like to know faster which 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 strain or like which species is there causing the infection so you're implementing the, the pro protocol you're but you're responsible for bioinformatics part so you need to make a kind of an algorithm in some sense right so you say okay the reads should be nicely mapped meaning like with high quality like the entire reads will be mapped that's one then you say um is there is a possibility that those reads will be also mapped to human, right? So, and then they really come from human, but they just look, I mean, they look like they're coming from HIV, but really they're not, they are actually human reads. How do you check that? So to do that, so perhaps you need to run to, the, to map it to the human genome as well and make sure those reads are not mapped to the human genome, right? And maybe if, but if they are mapped better on the human genome, let's say you have two mismatches for every of those reads, but when you map to who human, there is only one mismatch. If that's the case, you say those are human reads. I cannot claim them to be HIV. So what else? Maybe it's coming from not HIV, but some other microbial organism. So what you would need to do, you would need to take those reads and perhaps blast them or anyhow else to the entire tree of life to make sure there is no better hit. By hit, I mean like alignment. There is no better alignment to anything else because maybe it's like a different virus, right? And then there is some better map there. So you want to make sure that's not the case. So, so you can kind of now appreciate that despite technical parts to be straightforward, you, you, you should develop some thinking. Like when you implement that obviously to the clinic, not talk about validation, right? If you implement that in the clinical sex settings, you obviously need validation. So what will be the validation? perhaps compared to the culture base. So if you think about culture base to be extremely accurate, so then we would compare to the culture base and at least on the species level, right? I don't think culture base will tell you strain information, but species base probably it will, so you can validate that. So this is how you typically, the good framework to implement bioinformatics in the clinical settings that, you know, like you take a rigorous approach, you think about all the downsides and, and of bioinformatics and make sure the results are accurate. Also sensitive, right? We cannot put the threshold 100 reads and say, okay, that's fine, 100 reads, because you will in decrease your sensitivity so much because you will miss all HIV positive people having only five reads, for example, two reads, right? So, so that's like the entire kind of research project. And I think it's actually a good one. I think it was few publication recently claiming like nanopore was applied in the clinical settings to diagnose people. And I think the claim the accuracy is good, right? So remember nanopore is 20% error rate. So despite 20% error rate, I, I mean, I didn't need, I need to read those papers carefully, but, but uh, as, as far as I understand, you know, like it was okay, you know, 20% was, we were like the bioinformatics was able to handle 20% so that uh, to conclude that what, what, what was the type of infection. Okay, so that's how you kind of take bioinformatics projects. So like, you know, like you, you, like if you want to push it in the clinical setting, more like on the medicine side, right? So you, you want to validate that. You want to make sure you maintain precision, you maintain the sensitivity, turn around time, you know, like, like how fast you're delivering the results to the clinician and so on, right? So it's a quite complex project. I think that's the future. So that will be what we call genomic-based medicine, right? So that's, that's will be happening. Okay, so some useful commands for some tools. Um, remember the coverage, right? So at every position in the genome, 
you can say how many reads are covering that, right? So actually you can compute that using some tools. So to do that, you just say coverage, quite right? easy. You say SAM tools coverage BAM file. So it will tell you, it will tell you um, kind of like some, some number, I think it will tell you number of reads and average coverage, I think 0 0.59 and coverage basis, a covered basis and coverage and mean depth and so on. So like all those things and, uh, and then you can summarize the coverage for every map position, right? So that's called pile up. So we say M pile up. And then we actually only take, I mean, you can run it, you know, like, like that's fine. You can run this command actually and see what will be the output. So, but then we only want to take column number four. And this is how you do. And you sort. And then, so then what it will tell you, it will tell you, the average, I mean, the coverage for every position. Okay, so this is what we have got. So we have got seven, seven, 759 thousands nucleotide position have depth of one, right? So in this particular example, you know, like, like many, 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 like depth, like depth of one, meaning there was only one coverage, one read covering those position and uh, 1,835 nucleotides having depth of two. Right, so, so that's actually running this command, you kind of get the summary, right, like this. So you can see here, right? Uh, so you say this number of positions we're having coverage one, this number of positions we're having coverage of two. So how can you approach this command? So you can take it as a template and just use it, right? That's one approach, that's fine, you know, so you can use it. So actually, if you don't want to run this part, but rather on the first part, it will give you the coverage for every position. You know, for every single position, you will see what was the coverage. Okay. And actually, I think the information, was it like SNPs there and things like that? So you will get some idea. Now, what we do here, we say that we want to compute some kind of like general statistics, right? We want to know how many times was it one, how many times was it two. So what we do, we take that column where you have coverage, you know, like, like position number one, coverage one, position number two, coverage two, posi I mean, coverage two, position number three, coverage one, position number four, coverage one, and so on. So we take only that column. We, that's what is cut for is doing. We take only that column, which uh, uh, it's, uh, it happened to be column number four. Then we sorted those numbers and we do unique minus C. Unique minus C, will count how many times each number occurs. And that's exactly, you know, number num number one, you know, like, like digit one occurs this many times. Digit two occurs this many times. So that's what's exactly kind of the sum. Again, that's if too complex, just take that as the, as the command to use and then just be able to understand the output. So the output is the summary and this is how you interpret the output, okay? So I think it's like, as you will be working more which I hope so with the sequencing data, then, you know, like, like you can expand your sample. So here we would like to give you some very much, pretty much basics, you know, like, but there is quite many samples commands in general. Okay. So you can actually also, like you can look at the depth only in the particular region, right? So you can look uh, and, and region chromosome one, for example, and then between the position 27, thousand and I'm sorry, 26,800, 26,000, sorry, 810, right? So only in that range. So if you want to look only at that range, so, and then you only, only want to display column number two and three, so you can, right? And then what we will see that all the positions uh, here having the depth of one, right? So if you, because the genome is large, right? The human genome, but if you're interested in a particular region, say, what is the coverage there? For example, you're starting the HLA low site, right? You're starting HLA region. So you say, okay, I'm only interested to see what, how was my HLA region covered, right? So you give some common knowledge. What is the positions? I mean, what is the region, the coordinates of the HLA region in the human genome? So you provide that information and then you will get like the coverage right okay so a few more useful commands so you can actually know unmapped reads remember unmapped reads right the unmapped reads are the reads which were not we were not able to map 
for example, if we come back to that experiment where we're taking the human data, human sample, and we try to map it on HIV. So actually majority of these will be not mapped because they are human, but we are mapping on HIV, right? So if you want to know how many reads were not mapped to HIV, let's say you run this command. So you say same tools view minus C, minus C means you count, C for count, minus F for F lowercase. So minus F for lowercase will mean unmapped reads. So you count number of unmapped reads. So we have 28 unmapped reads. Then you can count the number of mapped reads. So the only difference here, you say, minus F capital, I write uppercase or capital for, right? So you, the difference is like lowercase and uppercase. So that will give you number of map reads. If you want to count number of reads in the region, so what you need to do first, you need to index the file itself, right? So we, we kind of learned how to index the, the reference genome before using BWA. So now if you want to count and access the particular region, you actually need to, to index them file. But I, and I would say that's a really good practice because many things can be only done on indexed file. So you would index BAM file, which again creates the data structure such that you are able to access the reads from the region, right? So because if you think about the BAM file, right, if there is no structure, how you find the reads from a certain region? It's hard. You need to go through each line. That will take you really a lot of time. So instead, there is some structure which kind of tells you which reach, which reads are in which region and so on, right? So that's like on the very simple way level what is indexing. So it says, you say samples view minus C name of the file, and you say in which region. So you say one, which means chromosome one, because that's how your reference was called. And actually, as you work more in bioinformatics, you will notice that it's quite confusing the formats. I think, as well as how the names of the reference. That's one particular example. So people couldn't agree, meaning that sometimes in the reference file, the chromosomes are called CHR1, sometimes chromosome, but more often CHR1, CHR2, and so on. Sometimes they're called just one, two, three, four. And somehow people didn't agree. I don't know why, but that's, that's the thing. So now I think it's causing so much trouble because when you run this command, if you if in the reference file it was chr1 but you say one your command will not work you need to go back to your bam file or like to your fasta file look and say oh what was the name of the reference oh it's actually chr and then you would change it here you will put chr here okay so that's actually one thing bioinformatics sometimes is tough in the sense of like conventions and so on so i think it's a young field just so it will be there eventually but 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 sometimes the formats are slightly different defined you know like and so in terms of standardization there is a lot of work to do okay so but that's just for you to know you know like that depends this one that's up to kind of whoever created the reference file you know like it can be one can be chr can be chromosome one whatever the people who created the FASTA file of the genome decided that to be. And you say the region, and you got like the coverage in that region, which is, I'm sorry, number of reads in this case. Number of reads in that region is actually 80 reads. May okay. I ask? Yeah, please. Uh, can we recapitulate again what was minus C, minus F, and minus capital F? In? Sure. Like minus yeah. C is counts, but yeah, counts C is of- count. So minus F lowercase, that means small, like small letter, lowercase. That means yeah. unmapped reads, meaning the reads which you were not able to map on the genome. Mm -hmm. And capital F or low uppercase F means the reads which are actually mapped on the reference genome. And okay, C count, like... and C counts, yeah. and C counts them. For example, you know, here, if you remove minus C, and you should, you know, like I think for those of you who were asking like, like some extra access, just play, I think playing with commands and asking the question, if I remove this command, if I change this one, what happens? And, and even looking at the data and saying, oh, that makes sense, you know? So for example, if you remove minus C here, what will happen? You will actually just see the map reads, right? So if you remove minus C on the screen, you will see the output. 
you know, so you will see 9,000 lines on your screen, and those will be the map trees. So here, if you remove minus C, you will see 28 files, and all of them will be unmapped. So there will be not much information. If the reads unmapped, there's nothing to say about them, right? You say read name, the sequence, but you don't know where it's mapped, right? Mm -hmm. And the same here, for example, if you remove minus C here, you will see on the screen just those reads being displayed. But C just make it easy because you can count. And actually, you know, like again, if you forgot minus C, you know the solution, right? You just put pipeline here, the bar, and say WC minus L, and that will be yeah. the same, right? So that will be the same. So, so I think Unix is nicely combined with some tools, you know, like in the sense like those basics commands which we learned. For, for Unix, I think that's what they will be helpful here. Okay, so any other questions? Okay. Okay, so yeah, so <clears throat> those are, yeah, so as I mentioned, <clears throat> those are map trees and unmap trees. Um, okay, so I mean, there is more than that, which we are not going to details, like this, how the reads are mapped, was it like paired and was because like you know there's a possibility then you have paired end you remember those paired end reads the reads which are composed of two parts so sometimes one part is mapped only one read from the pair and only this one or both or both unmapped right so a couple of possibilities and actually it's meaningful it's not just oh no it's just artifact no it's not i mean yes sometimes it's artifact of the technology but sometimes that's extremely useful information to detect, for example, structural variants. So structural variants are the big stretch of DNA, let's say not present in your genome, right? So in the reference, you have that piece, but when we take your DNA, we don't see it. So that's called deletion, right? Your genome has the deletion. And then sometimes it's like a severe thing and many diseases and like severe diseases are caused by, by the, those big structural variants. And to detect them, sequencing is good for that. So basically, if you have paired end, what will happen? You know, like one read is mapped, but then since you have an absence of that DNA because you have a deletion, another end will be not mapped. So what you see in the BAM file, you see one read being aligned or mapped and another read being unmapped. So that's a strong indication that there is somewhere in that region a deletion. And this is actually how the algorithms work. They take those what is called discordant pairs Discordant pairs are the pairs where one read is mapped and another is unmapped. And they there is quite few bioinformatics algorithms which can detect structural variants from whole genome data. It's hard. I mean, it's a hard problem. I think they struggle to define them up to base, you know, to know precisely where deletion is up to the base. But overall, I think 70%, I think we did the benchmarking, 70% or so sensitivity and precision, you know, like so. So they're quite good and it's an active, very active area of research. So what I'm saying is like, so BAM, those things in the BAM files are extremely important. You can derive many, many interesting insights about like structural variants, SNPs, and all other things from the BAM, from the BAM file, not talking about the QC. Like looking at the unmapped reads, you know, will be indicative, you know, like how the quality of the sample, because that's another way to look at the quality. Remember, we discussed FastQ, right? And FastQ, I forgot, FastQX, right? The tool which gives that box plot and then you see the quality. So that's one way to look at the quality. Another way, just map the reads. So if, the, if very many reads are unmapped, because this is what would happen, right? If the quality is bad, you will have a lot of errors. So as more errors you have, the reads will be just simply unmapped. Because I think by default, the aligners allow up to three mismatches per read. So, you know, if you have more, then it will be unmapped. So unmapped is another way, another QC quality control way to know if the quality is good or not, right? Or for example, if you miss, mass, I mean, if you um, put the wrong organisms, you know, if you're mapping the human data on the mouse genome, for example, or vice versa, mouse data on the human genome and so on. So that's like looking at the BAM file, that's extremely important things, you know, like both again for QC to understand the data beta, data beta, but also for other bioinformatics algorithms to derive uh, interesting conclusions like structural variants or SNPs, or actually like about the viruses being present, right? In the, in the patient, in the sample of the patient. Okay, 
Any questions? All right, so there are many alignment tools, and as I mentioned, there is 120 of them. Um, so uh, if you want to, to know about them, so you can just Google my name and say technology dictates algorithms. So we have a recent paper in genome biology, which we kind of explain the landscape of available read aligners. Um, so yeah, there is 100 of them, 120 of them, and some of them are designed for whole genome data. Actually, some of them are designed for both of whole genome data and RNA-seq. So HiSET2, for example, it's quite a recent tool, and actually it was designed for both. So it can do RNA-seq data as well as the whole genome data. Some of them are more specialized. So STAR will be only for RNA-seq data, right? So because it assumes that it's a gap, I mean, gap, I mean, there is a gap alignment. You remember spliced alignment, you know, like when read is coming from the exon exon junction. But remember, in the human genome, exons are distant from each other. So you should put half of the read here, then have a gap, and half of the read here. So that's hard. So this is STAR. STAR is doing that. Another, actually, very popular alternative to, bow, to BWA is bow type. And I think it's as good as BWA, so sometimes it becomes like a prof preference, what people trust more. There is no data kind of to, to support it. And actually, if you think about read alignment, right? So I mentioned we would like to do validation for bioinformatics tools, right? As soon as we develop bioinformatics tool, we want to rigorously benchmark it. We want to make sure as much as we can that the quality is good of our results. You know, sensitivity is good, precision is good, and so on. So. On that note, you would like to use some, some gold standard, or you would need to use gold standard. Um, for example, you know, like, like if you do, um, let's say, I know, cell, what will be the good example? So if you do, let's say structural variance, right? So you say, I would like to call structural variance based on the BAM files, and you run the algorithms, but you need to know those structural variants are accurate. So how you do that? You can run PCR tests, right? You can design primers and run PCR in the lab. So basically you got all the sequences from the, from the tools. So the tool tells you this is this structural variance, right? Meaning there is some sequence present in your sample. So you would go and check with PCR, is this sequence really present in my sample? So that's kind of always the case doing validation. But the issue is that and then it's preferable to do molecular based, some molecular based techniques for validation to define gold standard, like PCR, right? We trust PCR, so that's our true truth. That's our gold standard. You can do simulations, you know, like you can simulate the reads, you can simulate the, ref not the reference, but perhaps you can simulate the reads, you can simulate everything, but that's less reliable because simulations, you know, basically simulate the sequencing process, right? You can simulate on the computer using some models how the sequencing machine works and how they produce the reads. And kind of produce, given the genome, you can put the model which produces the reads from, from the genome as the real machine would do. Then what is the disadvantage of that? You oversimplify reality. Even though you think you know how sequencing machine works, but perhaps you don't know it to the full extent how the errors are distributed. Yes, we think they are randomly, but perhaps probably they're not. There is some, some specific kind of trends how they distributed some patterns. Now, what is the advantage? The big advantage is that you know the ground truth, right? Since you did simulate the reads, you know for every read where it's coming from, right? Because you, you're kind of, you're the gut. You, you created the reference, you created the reads and so on. So actually for read alignment, that's quite interesting problem, but there is no hope to do molecular based validation. And that's what, why I said that, yeah, we don't know what is better, bow type or BWA. So it's extremely hard to validate those tools. Why? Because it's not a biological problem, right? So read alignment is completely artificial problem. We are taking the reads, we are taking DNA from one person and roughly speaking, we are mapping we are matching that DNA for another person. That's not biology, right? There is no biological component in that. It's pure technology and it's actually pure observation that humans just happen to be very similar to each other in terms of DNA. That's why it's happening. Why, that's why read alignment is happening, right? So given that, we will not be able to define, to validate. When you run read alignment, you want to say, is it true? Is it correct? We don't know. So the only way to do it 
is to do for simulation, simulate the reads and so on. But remember, there is some disadvantage, right? We are oversimplifying the reality. So it's a big open question, how to show that the tools are valid and good. You can kind of do it indirectly by, let's say, looking at the SNPs or structural variants, right? So like, you know the SNPs, right? So, um, and then, you can ask the question, what is the impact of read alignment of, on your ability to call the SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, like the variants? So yeah, so that's quite open question. So, okay, so coming back, right? So there are alternative tools for, for, for read alignment and there is some evidence which are the best, but there is also not that much evidence. Okay, so you can actually do it not for the Unix like we do, but actually there are online tools like Blast. It's a quite old tool. I think that's mostly used and mostly famous bioinformatics tools designed. And I think the most cited paper and so on. So that's a nice tool. So what you can do, you can, um, you can take your sequence you got. You can actually take your read if you're curious from this class and, and go there or like from your sequencing experiment and go on the blast and, 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 and you know, click, do a couple of clicks and you have access to the entire tree of life. All the reference people know, right? Like all, every, all, every microbe, every plant, everything. And then it will be running on the cloud and it will give you the results where that read is coming from. So sometimes it's extremely useful for sequencing. You know, like you don't know what is the reference. You're given the sample, you actually have no idea. Is it mice? Is it like human? Is it rat? You don't know. So what you do, you take a couple of reads, let's say 10, 20, 100, and you map it on the blast. And then you will see, if the, like you will probably see that all of them are coming from human, all of them are coming from, from mice and so on. And then it's also helpful when, remember I mentioned that when we do observe three HIV reads, right? But we don't know, are those reads exclusively mapped to HIV or they can be, be mapped somewhere else. So that will be the case. We'll take those three reads and you can actually do that. So there are those reads. You can take those reads, open the blast, nucleotide blast and then blast it. And you will see perhaps no other matches than HIV. You will see those three reads only mapped to HIV, but nothing else. So that will be indicative that those reads are specific enough so you can make the conclusion about the that the person or the sample is HIV positive. Okay, so that's a good tool. Another tool, if you want multiple sequence alignment, which we didn't talk much because it's kind of a different problem. So we really focus on read alignment. But if you talk about multiple sequence alignment, basically when you try to match sequences of more or less equal length and you have many of them, so there are tools for that. So coming back to RNA-seq, right? So we, we, just, we said that we are given like the data you're working with, it's a gene expression data, right? So however, to obtain that gene expression data, you have several possibilities. Um, and one possibility is just to run read alignment, right? To run star, for example, and, and get quantification or there is a so-called pseudo alignment, and there is a tool called Selman, which is quite popular one, or Calista. And the way it works, you say you want to be really fast because read alignment is taking a while. And you say, I really want to be fast and actually I want to run it on my laptop rather than the cluster. So Selman gives you that opportunity. So it's extremely light in terms of computational memory it's using. So the reason it's using much less memory because it doesn't know precisely from where the read is coming from. Rather, it's only saying that read is coming from this transcript. I don't know exactly where, but I know from the transcript, from the transcript one. So it turned out that um, it's, so it's called com compatible. So to, to, um, you know, we cannot align the reads, but the rather which transcript is compatible with that read. So it turn turns out that computationally, this problem, and you're doing KMERS, so substrings, just, just for information. So, so doing that turns out to be so, can be done so effectively. So it's fast and can be run on laptops. It doesn't need much resources. So, and it sounds like it's a comparable accuracy to the tools which are using alignment, which takes very long time, like a few hours at least, and, and gene quantification. 
Okay, so just for information. So as you can see, field is quite evolving. So we have RNA seq alignments, we have which we did discuss less, but more like on theoretical point. Then there is a whole genome alignment, which we discuss in details. And then like we look at the files and there is also pseudo alignment, right? So people say, okay, actually to quantify, so it depends on the application, right? So if you say, I all I want to do is to quantify the genes. If that's the case, then you don't need to know position. Like why, why you care, right? You don't care about where precisely the read is mapped. Rather you only care, I care that that read is coming from this transcript. That's all I care, okay? So I think it's kind of dictated it's influenced by the question you ask. Okay, and then as you get the BAM file, very often people actually look at the data and, and then, you know, like, and then it's actually was interesting to see with the SARS and the COVID, how people were claiming new strains and so on. And some claims were just completely disaster in a sense. People were claiming that there is a, whatever structural variants of their uh, things of the SARS genome. However, this was purely artifact of the sequencing and actually pure artifact of real, uh, read alignment, right? So actually, if you realize that all we know about the strains, like I mean, uh, Omicron now and like, like del Delta before and so on, that's actually done based on sequencing and read alignment, right? So we, we, assemb we assemble the new strains and we compare to the previous one. So, so that's exactly more or less kind of similar what we have discussed, right? And actually the very first, the reason we know that it's actually SARS, but not other virus. So I think they just did read assembly, they assemble that viral genome and then they map it kind of through BLAST. They map it to all other, or through multiple sequence alignment as well. You can do that, like mapping to other viruses and they concluded that this SARS is different from other SARS by this number percent. That's why it belongs to the family of SARS, right? So it's all those algorithms. They are very basic. So applicability is quite wide. We, are, we talk about gene expression. We talk about human structural variants or SNPs and so on, HIV positive and things like that. But the same principle will be for, for, for virologists to conclude about new strains and features of the, of the virus, you know, structural variants of the virus and things like that. So now, so, so I think it's always important to look at the data and then would like to kind of emphasize it once again. So that's extremely important. And that's exactly the reason, you know, like when people were claiming that there is a new strain and there is a unique kind of features in the genome, when you open like this, when you look at the reads, those are your reads. So what you see on the, on the right, that's IGV browser. So that's a really nice tool. So you can look, you can look at your BAM file like nicely because you know, like and every read is like visualized. So, and, and you know, like, may, like colors are mismatches and you can see that some reads are having a lot of mismatches, some less and so on. But I think this is what, how was discovered that really that particular sample was not indicative of new strain of the SARS that people just opened that data in IGV browser and they look and say, okay, that's perhaps sequencing artifact. I mean, you need a lot of experience to say that, to, to kind of see the data and see the flaws of the data and biases, but that's the best way, you know, like look directly on the data. And actually IGV provides you, if you want to say, you know, like if you wish, like it's a lens for which you can look at the data. Some tools in the sense as well, but it's a different one, right? It's a more on the high level than you summarize things. So you need to combine those. If you have a lot of data, you cannot actually look at every single position. I mean, in the virus, you can, the virus is short, right? That's why people can actually look at it. It's short, it's quite feasible to look manually. However, for human, you would not. But then you can find the regions of concern, for example, or regions of interest and only look at that. So I think having those two tools, one, some tools, which is more high level, which give you some summary statistics, as well as, kind of very hands-on, you know, like something precisely look at every nucleotide. That's also important, right? Okay, so I think we'll, we'll be done soon. So, um, so I think um, the advances on in the sequencing technology in general have actually enabled the entire field of bioinformatics and bioinformatics from other hands, now it's a part of biomedical research where everything what you do with sequencing, being SARS, being COVID, or being detecting 
HIV of the patients or being detecting some, some strain which is causing the sepsis. Bioinformatics is the core of that. And, and then, and there is still a lot of research to be done to make it kind of, to, to push it on the clinical settings. And few factors hold that, sequencing errors, maybe time of sequencing, cost, as well as validations, right? So we really want to make sure that what we are doing bioinformatics and it's accurate and, and it represent, it's represent the samples well. Not talking about reproducibility, right? You would like to take this, that sample sequence in Moldova and sequence here in California and get the same result, right? So, so, but that's challenging because sequencing will be changing. It will be slightly different reads, the same DNA material, but reads will be slightly different, the same different error profile. So now it's on, on the bioinformatics tools to kind of maintain the same results, at least on the high level. So there is many, many open questions. That's why bioinformatics and, is an open area of research. And that's just starting, you know, like genomic medicine, which will be, which enabled or is partly or mostly due to bioinformatics. You know, bioinformatics is a big component of genomic medicine and genomic medicine is a personalized medicine, you know, like, so bioinformatics is the core of personal medicine, especially the genomic component of it. And there is so much work to do and, you know, like, and I think taking the small steps, like, like running the trials or clinical trials where you, you, you validate the utility of bioinformatics algorithms in the clinical settings and, and, and concluding that it's better and faster and cheaper. I think that's the way to go. And that is happening. A lot of startups happening and then, you know, like, like across the diseases where people sequence either the, the, the DNA or RNA or maybe epigenomics or transcriptomics or actually immune repertoires and then, and, and, you know, like, like hoping that's a useful information to the doctor, but actually validating that and showing the utility of bioinformatics. So I think possibilities are tremendous, but the skills are essential. So if you don't have the skills, you cannot operate in this field, but you need to have the skills to, to be able to analyze the data, but more so understand the data. So you can see, right, so to, to, to actually use bioinformatics and sequencing in the clinical settings, you need to appreciate and understand the differences between technologies, like even on the high level, you need to understand what's the difference between pack by and nanopore and Illumina, because you will be the one making the decision, right? You will be making the decision, what sequencing will I use? And sure, there will be some constraints like the budget, the time, but you need to understand fundamentally what that sequencing profile and error profile will mean, right? So for example, if you do nanopore to detect a particular disease, I mean, a particular virus in the sample, then you say, okay, that's okay to detect the virus. However, if you want to know precisely every kind of, um, or like, for example, if you want nanopore to call the SNPs, you know, like to know variants, perhaps nanopore is not the best one. One, you don't have enough coverage. And two, there is so much error. So perhaps what you call the SNPs will, the SNPs will be not reliable. But it's fine to detect the virus because you don't care about the particular strain, but rather you say that's one, that's that species. So 20% rate can be handled and you can still see that you can match the read to the species. That's all you need, right? You need to map the read to match the read to a particular species and say that read doesn't map anywhere else. So I'm concluding that the species is there, you know, particular virus. So wide range of possibilities, you know, biotech industry is booming. At least in the US, I think there are three hotspots in Boston, San Francisco, and San Diego. So two of them in California and one on the East Coast around MIT, Harvard, and Broad. You know, so it's booming. And then I think, you know, across, across the biotechnological companies, people are realizing there is a need for bioinformatics. There is a need for that. So I think possibility does. I hope you have very, very busy skills and knowledge, but that's a great start. You know, like now you can explore the things and like think about what would you like to learn next. And I hope we'll have just to work future for at least for those three months, but maybe more in the future. Okay, so um and I think Unix is essential, Python is essential, and you can many tools. So you don't need to develop them. Sure, you need to understand them as much as you can, you know, like appreciate the limitations of the tools. For example, you need to understand what is 
and between pseudo alignment when you and then and the real alignment, right? So that's something you know, like, but that's still bioinformatics. You don't develop the tools, but rather you take existing tools and think about how to employ them the best in the clinical settings. That's a great that's a great direction, and that's what many biotechnological companies are doing. And you know, like, if you put on, on the top some AI or machine learning, that's like the best startups perhaps nowadays, the most promising one. But again, you need to speak the language, right? So if you think about those possibilities in terms of biotech, like or, or collaborating with people, you need to speak the language, right? You need to, to understand the technology. So you need to kind of give your opinion about the technology or explain the technology, okay? kind of keep conversation, you know, like, like kind of know the details. Again, you can now, perhaps you don't know exactly how D6 works, you know, you don't know exactly what a statistical model, which is, I mean, it's nice to know, but if you don't know, that's fine. But you kind of can appreciate what is needed, right? People ask you, like, how do you run D6 to so the results are reliable? From this course, you can say, I would need several technical replicates because I want to make sure variation within the group should be larger than across the group. Sorry, vice versa. Variation across the groups to be larger than within the groups. I'll use full chaining, and that can go can get you far away in your career or like in bioinformatics, right? So, so okay. So I think opportunities are enormous. So it's all in your hands, you know. Like so again, we have three months. So it's all up to you how much you can to learn, how much you want to practice. But you know, like that's just the start. Okay. So I think we're then we're concluding here. You enjoyed the course. And then we'll have like five minutes if you have a couple of minutes, if you have like any kind of last minute question, but but we will be in touch. You know, like I will try like maybe once in a month, do one session by myself, you know, like maybe somewhere in February, we'll schedule the session, like question answers. I mean, in addition to what will be more technical hands-on TAs will be doing. So, you know, like if you have additional questions, think about the question, then we can do that like more informal chatting in the QA sessions. Okay, thanks for coming and thanks for all the hard work. I'm sure, you know, like that will pay off in your career development. Yeah, thank you.